Okay, so um, most of the time during this class, we've been talking about um, kind of peripheral sensory neurons. So you, you might have heard before that there's a difference between the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. Can someone tell me what that difference is? Are you Arya? Yep, that's exactly right. So the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system are all the, all the neurons that go out into your limbs um, and also to your sensory organs. For, so what we've talked about mostly is um, the neurons that go to your skin when we were talking about the sense of touch and the sense of temperature. And today we've talked about the neurons that go into your eye, so your eye is a sensory organ for vision. And tomorrow we will also talk about um, uh, the sense organs of the tongue and the nose for um, taste and smell. Um, so mostly our, that's what our cl class is focused on is all these different sensory organs, but obviously all your senses are being processed by the brain, and that's how you actually get to perceive all of these senses in your environment. Um, so we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the brain, and in particular one method of measuring activity in the brain. Um, so that's the, what the title of, of this little lecture is. Um, and this method is called electroencephalography, um, EEG for short. It's the really long word, so I want to help you break it down and figure out what it means. Does someone want to give it a shot and just tell me what each part of the word means? So we'll start with the first part, electro. Sounds like electricity, electricity which you've learned is a very central concept in, in the study of neuroscience because all the nerve cells run on electricity. And we can measure that electricity. What does encephalo mean? You might not have heard this before. It's kind of a weird word. It's Greek for the head or the brain. Um, and then graphy, what, what is this? A graph. Like a graph. So like a picture. Or, yeah. So exactly. So basically what this, what this word means um, is that you are making a graph of the electricity in the brain. It's pretty simple, right? Okay, um, so let's talk a little bit about how the brain processes vision. Um, so you, this might be sort of an image that you might have seen recently, um, and there's a lot going on in there. Um, <laughs> I won't give anything away. Um, so what you might not know, realize in your, in your daily life um, is that vision actually involves lots of different parts that are being put together. So Vision is such a central part of your life that you just, it, you know, you don't realize how it actually works because it just, the image is there in front of you and you don't realize how much processing is involved in actually putting that image together. So what are some individual features that you think you could pick out that might be processed um, individually to put together a picture? Faces. Faces, yeah, you have to process faces. Background, what do you mean, what's in the background? Yeah, <laughs> so colors definitely need to be processed. What else? What are some other ways of breaking down the picture? Yeah. Lines, yeah. Lines, shapes, yeah. Vibrancy, like if a color is more like brighter than another, like. So maybe light level, that, that could be a part of color also. Yeah, so um, you've hit all the main ones. So we have to parse out color, we have to put together different lines that make up shapes and patterns. Then we put those lines together and make objects. Um, if you were watching the movie of this, there's a lot of action, so there's a lot of movement that also needs to be processed. And um, our visual system is also extremely good at putting together faces. So sometimes we see things that faces as faces that aren't actually faces. So for example, if you think about a smiley face, um, it's just two dots and like a little line, and it's not really like a human face, but we still interpret it <laughs> as a face. Um, right, so our brain, instead of just taking the, the, all of this, the scene the way a camera would, and just mapping it, the whole thing, one-to-one -one onto your brain, your brain is actually picking out all these little different features, um, kind of giving them a meaning as in a line or a shape or a color, and then putting all together the whole picture so you can actually interpret what's going on. 
And the interesting thing is that um, many of these different features are being processed in different parts of the brain. And there are people that ha might have had a stroke or something where they get a damage in a very specific part, and they lose just one of these functions. Um, so for example, a person might become colorblind. Um, Vanessa mentioned a type of colorblindness where you can't distinguish red, um, red and green, but you could also just lose all of your color vision so that everything ends up being in black and white. Or you could lose um, your perception of movement, and then the way you perceive the world is just sort of a sequence of static images. So um, you don't realize this in your everyday life because the visual experience is so common to you, but um, the processing of this is actually quite complicated. Um, so I'm not going to go into all the details of how the brain does this, but I just want to give you an idea of, of how it works. So uh, um, in this diagram, uh, as Vanessa explained to you, um, the visual information from your visual fields enters each eye, and then that information gets passed on through the optic nerves into different regions of the brain. And it kind of passes it along from one region to another region where more and more complex information is being processed. So in the first point in the retina, you're just um, uh, getting the information from different points in your visual system. Then at the next step, that gets put together into lines. At the next step, that might be put together into shapes. At the next step, it will be um, objects. And um, sort of in parallel, some steps will give it color. Some steps will give it movement. Um, so kind of the first place where in the brain, in the cortex, where all this information goes is actually all the way in the back of your brain. Um, so from the front of your head, your eyes, the information gets sent all the way to the back of your brain. This part of your brain is called the occipital cortex, and that's where um, the, the first step of vision is being processed. And after that, as I explained, that information gets sent to all kinds of other places in your brain to process all the different parts and put together a visual image. And um, this is just for vision, but all of the other senses that we're talking about also have kind of designated places in the brain where they're being processed. Um, so for example, we talked a lot about touch, and um, Evan had showed you, or was it, or Victor, I don't remember, um, had showed you the homunculus, or the, um, the mapping of the body onto the somatosensory cortex, and that's where we sense touch. Um, this is where, where the vision is, in the back of the brain, and then there's also a place for hearing, and, a, and places for taste, and places for smell. All right, so how do we um, measure activity in the brain? And there are actually some different ways of doing that. Um, so the first one is, call, is a scan of the brain. Um, this is called fMRI or, or PET scan. You might have heard of that before. Maybe if you've had a concussion, you had to go to the doctor and get a, a brain scan to make sure that everything was okay in there. Um, and this is kind of an indirect way of measuring activity in the brain. Um, and it's basically looking at, at blood flow. So an area of the brain that is more active needs more energy. So the, the blood flows there. Um, another way is to use this EEG that we're going to try out today. The EEG um, uses electrodes. So it's uh, measuring the actual electrical activity happening in the brain. But it's only measuring it from outside your head. So this is kind of crazy because the electrical activity of your neurons is strong enough to measure it from outside your head. Um, another way is even more uh, precise, which is where you would put electrodes actually inside your brain. And we're not going to do that today because that would involve a lot of sophisticated surgery, and um, we're probably not allowed to do that to children. Um, so each of these methods kind of looks at brain activity at a different level. The first one is um, very broad, where you're looking at the activity of a, a large chunk of neurons altogether. The second one, and it's an indirect measurement, the second one is also looking at groups of neurons together, but it's directly looking at the electrical activity. And this third one would be very, very precise and very fast, where you can actually, you could even look at the activity of a single neuron at a time. But the drawback of this very precise method is obviously that it's very invasive, whereas yeah. these ones are not invasive. Yes, question. Um, for the PET scan, don't you have to inject some sort of radioactive chemical? Yes, and you do. That's how they're able to detect the blood flow? Yep, yep, that's exactly right. All right, so if we're, um, 
Yeah, and, and to do these scans, not only do you need to drink some radioactive uh, material, um, you also need a very expensive um, scanner. <laughs> and we don't have that one for the class. So that's why we're doing this sort of intermediate method that is easy to do at home. <laughs> Okay, so, but um, when we're doing an EEG, what do we actually um, measure? So as I said, if, if you're attaching an electrode to the outside of your skull, um, you're measuring the electrical field of a whole chunk of neurons that's kind of next to that area. And in this chunk, neurons are very, very tiny. So you could have thousands and thousands of neurons um, contributing to this signal that you're measuring. Um, so you can think of this signal kind of like people in a big stadium. And when you're outside the stadium, um, you would hear a lot of noise from the people inside the stadium, especially if there's a game going on, people get really excited, or they're just talking to their friends. So it's very noisy, and everyone is kind of saying different things. And when you're outside, you hear the noise, but you don't know exactly what's going on inside, because all the sounds cancel each other out. Um, but if everyone in the stadium is doing the same thing at the same time, for example, if they're all singing the national anthem, then you can tell from the outside what words are being said because all the sounds add onto each other um, so that you can distinguish the actual words. Um, so in the brain, uh, you, would, you would have the same kind of thing. And uh, importantly, Um, as we've talked about many times, the neur each neuron sends an action potential down its axons. And that's the main way that, um, that neurons send signals, is through electricity. But neurons also need to be able to communicate with each other, and they do that at a place called a synapse. And I know some of you already know what synapses are, because we mentioned it the, um, previously. And in a synapse, the signal is actually a chemical signal instead of an electrical signal. Um, so once the electrical action potential has reached the end of one neuron, chemicals travel from one neuron to the next neuron to tell the next neuron to send another electrical action potential. And each neuron is connected to many other neurons. Um, <laughs> many, uh, so e yeah, each neuron is connected to many other neurons. And um, if you made a diagram of all the connections being made, it would start to become very, very complicated. And you get these networks of neurons all talking to each other. And one feature of networks is that the activity of a network creates waves. So if all the neurons in a network are um, signaling together at the same time, you get a big wave with a big signal. Whereas if neurons are um, sort of not, not talking to each other as efficiently, or if they're all doing different things, then you would get a smaller signal because um, just like in the stadium where everyone is talking about different things at the same time, um, the, the signals cancel each other out. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. So in the brain, you can get different types of waves depending on what kind of activity the brain is doing. And um, so one kind of wave you could have is a beta wave, which is very small in amplitude and very high frequency. And that means, so can someone tell me based on what I just told you, what, what is your brain doing, what is happening with all the neurons in your brain if you have a small signal like this, if you have fast waves? Can you say that again? Lots of signals are passing and communicating. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> good. So there are lots of signals, lots of neurons are doing different types of things, and that's why the wave looks very small and fast. On the other hand, if you have a slower wave, like the alpha wave, um, what would be happening there? Less activity, okay. Are you? More synchronized, exactly, that's exactly right. So the more synchronized the neurons are, the slower the waves are and the bigger the waves are. So in what circumstance, so if, if you have a beta wave and there's lots of activity going on, that's a kind of thing you would have happen when you're awake and you're listening to the lecture and um, and there's lots of processing going on in your brain. If you have something like an alpha wave and your um, neurons are becoming more synchronous, why would that be? What kind of state are you in if that happens? Sleepy. Sleepy, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, you might be zoning out, or if you're meditating, you can get this kind of brain wave. Um, 
And then basically the more, the bigger your wave becomes, um, the more synchronized they are and the more uh, sleepy you are, or more asleep you are. And the, the biggest wave that you can have in your brain is a delta wave. And if that happens, you're in very deep, dreamless sleep. Um, if you're dreaming in your sleep, what kind of wave do you think you would see? Can you say again? Theta. Theta? OK, so you think you'd have this kind of wave if you're dreaming? Does someone have another idea? Actually, when you're dreaming, there is a lot going on in your brain, and it looks even closer to a beta wave, just as though you were awake, even though you're still sleeping. OK. So what does this mean for the visual system? So let's say you're looking at this very complex visual scene. And um, it, when you're looking at this, your, um, so this is your whole, your whole visual field. And each of your photoreceptors in your eye are seeing uh, different parts of the visual field. And they have a lot of information to process, right? There are different colors going on here, lots of people doing different things. Um, you might even be looking for Waldo. Um, tell me if you find him. <laughs> OK, good. So your, your visual fields are very active right now from looking for Waldo. Um, so what kind of wave would you have right now? Yeah. Beta wave, exactly. Um, on the other hand, if you had a very boring visual scene, like just a, a blank space, oh. or if your eyes were closed, what kind of, uh, what is going on now? More like alpha. More like alpha, yeah. So a slower wave, because now your, your photoreceptors and your neurons don't have so much information to process, because it's all the same. And if your neurons are all doing the same thing, they become slower, slower and more synchronized. synchronized. Exactly. So the more synchronized they are, um, the bigger your wave will look. And we can actually demonstrate this um, using our little EEG kit um, that we have here. Um, and for this, we will need um, a volunteer. <laughs> 